540 here. There's a pretty funny hashtag going around on Twitter that Elon Musk has endorsed. And that is Ben the ADL. So the Anti-Defamation League is both an ethnic lobby and probably the premier force in the world for restricting free speech on public spaces, particularly social media. On the other hand, how different would the level of restrictions be on social media and the public space if there were no ADL? I'm not sure they'd be that different. But uh, Duvid got into it with History Speaks, Matthew Gabriel. And so let me play some of this Twitter space here, but posted by the Twitter account History Speaks. He's a PhD student at the mainstream uh, authorities. Maybe so note that people will be able to come back. Here. Um, so okay, here we go. Right? I've been um, perturbed by this whole ban the ADL thing, and here's why. If you followed me, you know that I have no sympathy for this organization. I have no sympathy for people who are advocating censorship online. They're a crazy left-wing organization. They've adopted the definition of racism that excludes whites. You know, I have no sympathy for this organization. So why would I be, why would I be perturbed? I should be happy that there's a movement against them. Well, I'm upset because I'm also not an advocate of race hatred, of anti-Semitism, of Nazism, of these things. I oppose these things, in point of fact. And I think, you know, I'm obviously just a normal person here. I think mainstream society should oppose these things and stigmatize them. I don't think they should be banned. I don't think any of these people uh, who advocate such views should be banned from social media. But the fact that they are being validated by amazing personalities on the right, and then perhaps the richest man in the world with Elon Musk, is disturbing to me, and I think symptomatic of a broader problem that's going on the right. There's just no guardrails, that the contempt for the left has grown to such a level, which is understandable, I share it, that it's basically just populist madness. And whatever the sentiment is of the masses a certain day, right-wing influencers, whether it's Matt Walsh, who endorsed this, Charlie Kirk, who endorsed this, Marco Knowles, who endorsed this, others I'm sure have as well, they just go with whatever the populist raving is at a certain moment. And that's very concerning to me. Uh, we can't overlook the cause of it, which is the failure of, of kind of mainstream authorities in our society. Um, you know, there are many reasons for the failure. One of them is, as I said, uh, white, I think the, like, white people feel alienated from them because of this crazy uh, discourse where, oh, it's impossible to be racist against whites. It's ADL, ADL endorsed, for example. But as we oppose that, you know, as, as people of different backgrounds, not just white people oppose this, a lot of different people oppose this. My mother isn't white. I don't really feel white or identify as white myself. Um, the uh, As we oppose this, we have to um, maintain so I think uh, Matthew tends to speak carefully. He tends to have a, a great deal of respect for, for facts. So I think he, he's making good, solid points here. And if you're interested, I believe his mother is Egyptian. In our society, the society that has been built in the United States for, for decades, which is one that, that is tolerant and rejects race hatred and Nazism and fascism. And when you empower people like this, I mean, Keith Woods is engaged in blatant Nazi rhetoric. He calls Jews parasites, right? He is engaged in apologetics for the Nazis themselves, which I've refuted on my page. This is um, this is socially destabilizing. It's dangerous. They should be allowed to speak. That's part of who we are too. That they're allowed to speak, right? It's part of who we are as Americans. That they're allowed to speak. But and you know that's changed in recent years. There's been some effort to ban everybody who has fringe views. I disagree with this, um, but that's it might be part of who we are too. But uh, it's it's disturbing to see these people validated. And uh, what's also laughable is the idea that people like Musk or others who endorse them are just blissfully unaware of the anti-Semitism motivating this. That's just a joke. I mean, I'm not even going to entertain that because if you believe that, you're either you know you're either you're either so ignorant of the basic facts that you just shouldn't be talked to. Like, it isn't that you're a bad person if you're ignorant, but it's just like you don't know what's going on, so you're just not really worth talking to on this matter unless still you learn more. Maybe they're so ignorant. Or two, uh, you're just lying and being deceitful because if you know anything about these guys or look at their feeds, like, they promote hatred of Jews. Not hatred in the woke sense where you're, like, you're looking cockeyed at Jonathan Greenblatt, but genuine hatred of Jews. I don't agree with that. I, I, mean, I wouldn't... Here's another thing. I oppose the Black Lives Matter organization, right? The, the views they espouse, I think, are, 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 are divisive, destructive, uh, you know, uh, stereotypical contemptuous of whites. I would never jump onto some campaign to ban BLM from Twitter that was launched by David Duke and Andrew Anglin, because this is obviously just a proxy for hatred of blacks. And this similarly is a proxy for hatred of Jews. So I'm not going to endorse this, and nor should you. You're being uh, socially irresponsible if you do, uh, frankly. And yeah, I'm concerned that right wing, we, we've moved to the point where uh, the discourse is so open on the right that there's just no, there's no constraints, there's no limits. That does uh, concern me, not just on this, but on other issues. We have to look at why, how this came to be, as I said earlier. But, and I think the left, the failure of mainstream elites has played a huge role in this. But um, just adding some speakers, I'm going to talk a little bit more, guys. I'm going to get your opinions. Um, and by the way, if you're on the other side of this, you know, I'm a free speech guy. I, 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 I emphatically, contemptuously disagree with your views. But you can, you'll be if you don't, you know, say anything outrageous, you can share your views. Uh, Errol may disagree with me, for example. I, I think he's responsible enough to allow to speak. But yeah, that's basically my take. Um, so three points. Um, th this is a proxy for hatred of Jews. This is not about one organization and its, and its influence. One, uh, uh, two. Uh, the substantive proposal itself to ban the ADL is an anti-free speech proposal. They should be stripped of any power to uh, censor discourse. They're a gross, 
uh, cocooned woke organization. You know, they also another problem I have with them is they conflate criticism of Zionism with which, which you know, I'm a critic of Zionism. They conflate that with with hatred of Jews, which is stupid. And then the third the third point I'd make is this is indicative of just a genuine trend on the right, with just we have no guardrails anymore. We have to just have pure whatever the the, the populist discourse is into today is just what we have to endorse, and that, that's that's of concern to me. But the fourth point is the left has some responsibility for this too, because uh, you know they have the failure of experts has basically led any it has basically led any appeal to expertise and norms uh, to be just contemptuously rejected by the right. So I think I think there is some response for the left too. And here's another thing the left is responsible for. Like, you know, they call so many people Nazis and racists. I've been called these things. I'm sure I will be in the, I'm poised to be in the future. They've, they've overused terms like racism and anti-Semitism to the point that when you get actual people like Keith Woods calling Jews parasites and, and aping actual Nazi rhetoric, it doesn't have the same punch to say, oh, this is this guy's a neo-Nazi or because of the, of the boy who cried wolf effect. So the left is a problem here too. And also the ADL is just, just a hard organization to defend with, with, with what they're up to. It's very difficult to defend. I mean, it's, it's, that's why nobody, like, you know, nobody really likes them. If you look at their... Okay, that's uh, History Speaks Twitter account, Matthew Gabriel, a PhD student, history student of history at the London School of Economics. And uh, thanks to Duvid for pointing out that uh, Nathan Kofner supports this uh, idea of Ben the ADL. So Nathan Kofner tweets September 2nd, the ADL an organization that exploits the tragedies of Jewish history, fraudulently claims to represent Jews, and spreads vicious libel. It's literally one of the main causes of contemporary anti-Semitism. Elon Musk, if you want to fight anti-Semitism, don't ban Pepe the Frog. Instead, ban the ADL. And Kofner's response to the question, what about free speech? There is no free speech. Thousands of people get suspended every day for lawful speech. To make it fair, the ADL should be treated the same way as other hate groups, according to the rules that the ADL itself helped to write. And Nathan Kofner's published an article in Quillette on the ADL's practice of falsely accusing their political enemies of anti-Semitism. And scrolling through more of uh, Kofner's Twitter feed, he says... uh, Norm MacDonald was right that Bill Mayer is the unfunniest person that's called a comedian. Bill Mayer is also the least intelligent person that's called smart and the least transgressive person that's called politically incorrect. Okay, so let's uh, get back here to uh, History Speaks. Matt, speaking here. Their their Twitter. I mean, it's like they have like 10,000 views per like, which is just ridiculous. So... Um, nobody likes them. They're awful. But this is like a Nazi thing. Uh, I mean, look at the people behind it. Pa- Matt Parrott, uh, Keith Woods. You know, this is uh, Nick Fuentes. These are obviously people. This is a proxy for hating Jews. I think I've, I've talked enough. I'm going to get some different uh, views on this. Uh, DS, uh, um, you can go ahead and then. Listen, I mean, I know people have issues with the ADL, okay? And you can criticize them. But to say they're gross, horrible, no one can defend them. Let me, let me just give you some background. Uh, I've been doing historical research about these uh, Nazis in the 50s and 60s. The ADL was doing some of the most important investigative work about these organizations at the time. This is really valuable work. They have the most long-running an- uh, 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 poll on anti-Semitism that researchers rely on. To just characterize the whole organization as horrible, I think, is just totally wrong. Uh, can I have my opinion here? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so all I wanted to say basically was that um, I, I think that the ADL would be better off um, talking about um, – forgive me for the mic quality, by well, the way. I, I can't hear really. anything. If somebody's talking to me, I really? can't hear Yo, uh, can you can you hear me? Okay, or yeah. Come so on, all guys, I was all, I okay, good. so um, all I was trying to say was that the um the hey, ADL is someone else talking. Sorry, I can't hear anything. They, would, they should be better off like trying to debunk myths as opposed to like talk about why uh why this is anti-Semitic or that is anti-Semitic. They should be better off like for example debunking fake quotes about Jews. Like for example, there was an Ishmael Levitz like quote from that said like for example how we need to like rape white people or something like that. It's obviously fake. It's obviously fabric. It's obviously fabrication. But the way that these people operate is they need to lie. Like I saw I hypocrite. If you guys know the uh, if you guys know the uh, Twitter user I hypocrite, he posted a fake link from something called the Jerusalem Postal. It's not a fucking it's not a fucking um thing. It's it's called the Jerusalem Post. But he photoshopped something from a Jerusalem Postal and it got like two thousand likes. So I think the ADL would be more liked if they started debunking um shit like that and didn't like and basically left um left like talking about like immigration and politics to like other organizations you know yeah so to both of your comments here's the first one i i can i can i'm open to the idea that i'm being polemical or angry when i talk about the ADL. i'm frankly just personally fed up and this isn't a polit- political argument but I mean, i've had multiple people on the left um try to get in contact with my university attack me personally threaten me with, with cancellation. So I just do not have patience for these people at this point. Uh, who are, and I see the ADL as the ilk of these people. Like, oh, let's let's be the hall monitors and figure out who's saying something bad, you know? I just have no... And I don't want to live in a society like that. Even Nazi scumbag monsters 
who have no empathy for, for the Holocaust victims, yeah, they're disgusting. But I don't want to live in a society where some body of blue haired white girls can just ruin careers or destroy people based on whether they consider something to be hate, because they're going to not just say the Nazis, they'll say anybody they disagree with, like me, is, is, is hateful, and I'm not a hateful person. So I just see the ADL as of a piece with this very censorious group of people that don't want you to be able to make a life in mainstream society. Now, they haven't gone after me, so I'm not talking, saying, claiming that's personal, but I just see them of a piece with these people that don't want anyone right of center or with kind of edgy views on any question uh, to be able to make a living in mainstream society. So yeah, there could be some impatience or exasperation on my part. I'm not claiming they've done nothing, but I don't know much about them really other than what they're doing these days. So um, anyone else want to um, contribute? Yeah, if I could. Get on. Yeah, um, I think I mentioned, uh, uh, I think the ADL on net is really probably does a lot more harm to Jewish people uh, rather than it ever does help. At least in, in recent years, it seems like you know all the uh, kind of exaggerated. You point to a couple examples of, you know, only white people can create racism. 17% uh, uh, of the numbers, one through 100, are, you know, racist or, or hateful or, or what have you. Uh, I think all that really does is uh, just kind of, um, I don't know, inflames in, in normies, I guess. And uh, it's why we get kind of, you know, that you mentioned kind of the guardrails have come off, you know, all the censorious approach. Here is uh, Matt talking about Nick Fuentes. He talks about the glorification of hillbilly culture on the right. Right, recently represented by the promotion of the abysmal rich man, rich man from Richmond song is cringe. Still, this is sociopathy from Nick Fuentes. It exposes his Catholicism as a sham. Compassion for the poor is a core Christian duty. So this is Catholic Nick Fuentes doubling down on his recent rant about poor white people. Here we go. The people of this country are furious. They don't like my hatred for the poor. They don't, they don't like that, and I don't know why. I don't get it. Uh, but I don't care, because I do fucking hate the poor, and I hate poor people, and I hate poverty, and I'm sick of lying about it. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I don't, okay? I love the rich. I don't, I don't have any animosity for the rich men of America, okay? The people okay, that's just funny. So, I don't know, to... To go after Nick Fuentes for that, I, I think was uh, pretty weak. Uh, that was just that was just a funny bet. Okay, back to History Speaks hosting a discussion on the ban the EDL hashtag campaign approach and you know, this heavy-handed kind of censorship. I, I, I think on that just you know really poisons the discourse and it, it inflames hatred on both sides. So I'm I'm supportive of the kind of the the, the movement to I don't know if I necessarily want to see them get banned, but just so, you know, so the so the neo Nazi hashtag that doesn't poison the discourse, but the ADL does, huh? So you're talking about the ban the ADL hashtag as the yeah the one that uh, uh, the Irish neo Nazi and Nick Fuentes came yeah. up with, yeah. So um yeah the the source of the hashtag. So that's an you know interesting point uh, you guys brought up. Um, so a lot of leftists will they'll say you know at least the the ideals of the United oh, we're, States. Yo, we're really debating this. Well, sorry, my, my point is just that uh yeah the, the source of it you know. Obviously, might have its problems. I don't agree with you know the, the, all the views of those people, but you know, debate the idea on its own merit. Right? I mean, you know, let's just debate the argument. Don't you know? Even even if the people who came up with paper... can, can can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Who, who would you rather be on Twitter, the ADL or um, hundreds of prominent violent neo Nazis? Hundreds of what? Prominent violent neo Nazis. Uh. So you need to think about it. Okay. Well, that that's a good enough answer. So thanks for thanks. Okay. For my thing on that. this is first of yeah. all, I'll say this. First of all, I don't, I don't know that we can say, and I don't, I'm going to be accused of sticking up for these vile people, but I don't know that we can say Woods and these people, certainly the neo-Nazis. Okay, the ADL has billions of dollars behind it. So the ADL can do, perhaps, can do a lot more damage than uh, neo-Nazis who may well never have even graduated high school. Uh, on the other hand, uh, neo-Nazis are far more likely to commit violent crimes than members of the ADL. So is reasonable, but I don't think we can say they've advocated violence without evidence, because that's a, that's a different level in this. I, I'm not, I, I'm not, I wasn't necessarily talking about him. Yeah, I'm not aware of the Anti-Defamation League advertising violence. It's a <clears throat> left-wing pressure group that uh, uses the, the uniform of fighting bigotry to pursue its own agenda of bigotry. Okay. That, yeah, I'm just, I was just ask, asking hypothetically. All right. Anyway, uh, the other point is where I agree with you, and I strongly disagree with Errol. Is I think at some t at sometimes people say, "Oh, guilt by association." At some point, you know, if if the instigators of a movement are all extreme hate-filled neo-Nazis, you have to you have to question the motives of the movement. It's like if if, if there's a reasonable-sounding cause, and you find 
that um that everybody that all the people behind it are pedophiles you have to wonder what the motivation is, uh-huh. even if the even if the cause doesn't seem to be about pedophilia right so I'm, I'm not saying that neo-nazis are as bad as pedophiles but my point is you can't have an absolute aversion to to guilt by association even though that's almost a cliche you have to look at what the motive is and i think it's obvious what the motive is they, they see this organization as uh, disliked widely disliked on the right as akin to like the splc and so on i've criticized them many times for example uh, i don't like them and the, but they're using that as a way of basically trying to associate all Jews with sensory with a lot with the parade of horribles they don't like, like censoriousness and controlling things. And they're just it's obviously a sham. My point is, it's obviously a sham to promote like hatred of Jews, because you, you just have to, at some level, exercise common sense and say, why are neo-Nazis all behind this? And why is it or why is the originating? Why, why is it originated by them? I mean, it's not these are people who believe in free speech themselves, really, you know. Well, isn't it obvious, though, that uh... I mean, the main people who are are the people that have been at the brunt of the ADL are the people that have been on their watch list that have been pushing to be banned. So if you're looking like uh, the main names in it, Lucas Cage. Uh... All right, David speaking here in this history space. Keith Woods, uh, you know, someone, uh, Nicholas Fuentes, Adam Green. These are all people who have been censored by the ADL for years that the ADL made a specific point to try to censor them. So it's just a coalition of interests. So like Elon Musk has his own problem with the ADL because the ADL has went after him. The ADL is continuing to go after him. And then there's the issue of, yeah, the counter semites the ADL does a lot of things, but its essential thing is protect the Jewish people. So its main, um, you know, so to say victims of the ADL are anti-Semites. So obviously it's similar to Richard Spencer when he had his, uh, you know, veered into the far right by teaming up with the you know, vicious anti-Semites and with just a convergence of interest. Uh, so I think you have to differentiate it between Elon Musk, conservatives, their problem with the ADL, and just the fact that they're teaming up with the people, like, uh, and then even to divide the numbers, let's say there's 100,000 people right now, they're actively, you know, pissed at the ADL probably only 10,000 of them are vicious anti-Semites and they're just the loudest uh, voice in the matter. I think it's hard to know. So that was David, uh, for, if you guys know him. I think it's hard to know if um, what, what the average person tweeting this says. Uh, but it's, I think that anyone who has any level of sophistication about internet culture and so on knows that this is like a neo-Nazi 4chan type deal. And it just comes down to what, whether you think there's any limit to you know, who you should associate with. Like, is ISIS okay? Is, is pedo- are pedophiles okay? Again, I'm not saying that Keith Woods is as bad as those people. My point is there has to be some principle where this is beyond the pale of whom I'm going to line up with politically, right? I'm not saying that Keith Woods is beyond the pale of, of what should be allowed on Twitter. I don't think he is. I think he should be allowed, for the record. But, but like, about did, you know, no, but there also should be some ethics. Oh, you, have to make a, it, it, you have to team up with who it's going to take to win. And, uh, you know, so obviously there's a huge spot of people like right-wing Jews, Orthodox Jews, uh, the broad uh, sport of Trump supporters, uh, Elon Musk supporters don't like the ADL versus the you know, the far right uh, counter semites that have been you know, pushing this basically every day for a year. And now there's just a convergence of interest. If it's Elon Musk basically saying like ADL, if you don't back up, I'm going to team up with the. And a good question from the chat from Laponius. How likely were members of the Jewish Defamation League to commit violence? About uh, 50 times more likely than your average Jew. So yeah, the the GDL, the Jewish Defense League, they. They were a frequently violent and criminal bunch. Vicious counter semites. Yeah, I don't see. What, I don't what, see what, that on DS. I'm gonna let DS speak. I don't see. Yeah, yeah. Don't that should be called out too. DS. I'm gonna let you call it out. But first, the first point I'm going to make is, um, I think that people like Matt Walsh, um, uh, Charlie Kirk, Michael Knowles, who mainstream conservatives who endorsed this, they did it in a reactive way. It wasn't like, oh, let's team up with the Nazis because we don't want the ADL. They felt like pressure from their people to yeah. do this, which which is also disturbing because I don't want, you know, somebody who identifies myself with the right. I don't want the right to. Con- I want the right to fight anti-white garbage. Yeah, so much of you know right wing punditry is really low IQ, just jumping on board with whatever's popular. And I agree with, I agree with Matt's critique here. Uh, I'm trying to stay open to Nathan Kofnis's point as well. So I don't have no, I I don't support Ben the ADL. So I guess I disagree with Nathan Kofnis, and I guess I side with with Matt here. I don't think I've ever said anything positive about the ADL. But they did do some good work, right? They help to keep track of, you know, people who are looking to commit massive numbers of violent crimes. So they they do help uh, help uh, improve a detection of potential mass murderers. They do have programs to help uh, organizations to keep themselves safe from the attacks of mass murderers. So, I mean, until now, I don't think I've ever said anything positive about the ADL, but now when you, if you put, put a gun to my head, yeah, there are some good things the ADL does. I, I do not support ban the ADL from, from Twitter. I want the, the right to fight against censorship, including the people like Keith Woods and so on. I do not want the right, and I'm appalled at the idea of the right, lining up with people engaged in race, hatred, Nazism, Jew hatred, etc. So now go ahead, Diaz, because I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, condemned. I was honestly just curious why, what, 
And a good point in the chat. Elon Musk says that uh, Twitter's advertising revenue is still down 60% in the United States and that the Anti-Defamation League is mostly to blame. What's with the term? But you know, let me, just a larger point. Um, I just want to directly ask. So I think, and I think you're, you're an academic, right? So I'm training. It's, it's exactly most... for some reason by everybody, but I'm not a historian yet. I'm going to be in like two years, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I believe the most long running comprehensive um, data we have on anti-Semitism in America is, is an ADL poll that they've been doing for decades. You dislike this organization so much, you'd prefer that they just had never done that? Well, th that poll is really bogus. So if you believe that Jews have disproportionate power, that's counted as anti-Semitic. But there are areas in life where Jews are disproportionately influential. So there are all sorts of things that the ADL classifies as anti-Semitism that are not, that, that are simply noticing reality. Yeah, I think that most right-wing Jews, most... No, 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 I wasn't, sorry, sorry. I was asking... Like the ADL. So there's a large swath, like 20 okay, percent of the population that always dislike the ADL. Quiet, I'm just address question to me. Um, I don't want them to be banned or anything like that. I would like them to lose the ability to, like, influence corporations to ban things. No, no, I'm saying, you. do you wish that they had never, like, had gone under decades ago and they'd never I'd have been to be, able I'd to have do that, to be that, that because research? I don't understand their history. I, I don't understand this claim also about this guy who's accused of these horrible crimes, whether he's innocent or... I, 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 this is a question I haven't done research into. I can I can see in the, the contemporary world, I see them as a, a woke, cocooned, naive, li like, effete liberal group that wants to, like, ban people they don't like, which which I... Uh, yeah. Uh, may I object to play a... Uh, let let, let um, uh, both Leg Day speak and um, Hero of Justice, because both of them are, have a lot to offer and they haven't spoken yet. But either one of you go ahead and then the other speak. And then do be quiet down for a second. I'll let you speak later, okay? All right. So okay. it seems that the uh, the ADL and their enemies have like a weird sort of symbiotic relationship where on one hand, you know, the more uh, extremism there is in the world, you know, the more, I guess, reason the ADL has to exist and the more like censorious uh, the ADL gets, you know, the more ire they're going to provoke. So it's kind of like a, a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, but what I wonder is, I'm not sure that, you know, not that I think the, the strategy of censorship is the Okay, in the chat, we've got someone saying Jews are disproportionately represented in leading anti-whiteism. Really, are they that much more, you know, woke than, say, Anglicans, Episcopalians, than uh, mainstream Protestants? I, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I mean, there are plenty of countries in Europe with very little uh, Jewish influence, with very few Jews, such as Sweden or, or Germany, and they are just as, you know, woke and uh, left-wing as countries such as the United States with a substantial Jewish population. The best thing, but I don't know if it ultimately will break down because, uh, or, you know, it will lead to some sort of institutional failure. Because it seems what's happening is that sort of uh, the left is getting more like ensconced in their epistemic framework of trust the experts. And then the right is getting more ensconced in their epistemic framework of, well, we'll just believe the opposite and, you know, whatever, whatever that part leads us to, you know, aliens, uh, they're this flat, whatever. And it seems like the more crazy the right gets, uh, the more dangerous they get in a way, but they also become more ineffectual, I think, like uh, unable to like seriously control anything just out of like pure uh, wackiness. So I wonder, uh, I wonder if uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I guess it could it probably will lead to like more attacks, but it does seem like uh, the EDL strategy in a very weird way works accidentally. Can I, can I just interject? Right, go ahead, Lightning, and, and then I want to hear from Robert because he hasn't a chance to speak. But go ahead, Lightning. Okay, I, I just want to interject something here. Um, I, I think this illustrates the fact that anti-Semites have a very, very difficult time grappling with reality. The reality of the ADL is that it gets attacked as much from the left as it does from the right. And it doesn't have, it, it's not entirely about their stance on Israel. It's, um, it's about their states. They, they cooperate with law enforcement and they have, a, because of that, they have a very poor relationship with BLM and with a lot of the progressive groups. So, I mean, yes, they're a Zionist organization, but, you know, given the fact that Israel has been around for almost 80 years and half of the world's Jews live there and they're a Jewish organization, I mean, they almost have to be a Zionist organization at this point, just, you know, the facts on the ground. And I, I don't think that they understand, like, I don't think the people on the far right just, like, understand what the ADL actually is. It's, it's, uh, it, it's an ethnic organization, just like, you know, there's, there's, there are Assyrian ethnic organizations and Armenian ethnic organizations. And I mean, because of that, it's, it's pulled in different directions. I mean, there are Jews who are very liberal, who want a more universalist agenda. And there are Jews who are more particularist, more conservative and particularist, who wanted to focus solely on protecting Jewish interests. So the ADL does contradictory things because there's different people within the organization who have different agendas. Um, you know, and, and it's just like any other organization because Jews are simply people like everyone else. And um, but I, I don't know, anti-Semites have a hard time grappling with this. So, I mean, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of them as an organization. I agree with DS that they do a lot of good research, um, you know, but they're one of the few uh, people who actually do, attempts to research anti-Semitism in a sort of dispassionate way. But obviously the organization itself has an agenda. And 
So, I mean, I, I get why it's problematic. I just, I just don't think that the people on the far right have a grasp on reality of what the ADL even is. Let, let, can I just say, just to follow up on that, again, if anybody does any archive research on um, neo-Nazi groups in the 50s or 60s or 70s, you will see that basically you are reading a lot of the fruits of the research that the ADL did, archiving, publications, just doing basic research. So I, I, I think the uh, legacy of the group, look, I, I'm not, I'm not going to defend everything about it. I don't know everything about it. But overall, that they, they've done a, a substantial amount of research on uh, the most violent and extreme neo-Nazis. And I see that as a good thing. I mean, I, I, you know, that is a good thing that they did. They did some research on the most violent and extreme neo-Nazis. I mean, I do think that politically, I mean, there's a lot about their politics that as a conservative, I'm not comfortable with. Right. I don't necessarily think that they represent Jews in general. And I, I don't think, you know, but the thing is, is that ultimately, at the end of the day, they're simply an ethnic organization. The American Jewish Congress is, is composed of like 50 different organizations. And some of them are on the right. Some of them are on the left. And the only the only thing they have in common is their focus to some extent on Jewish interests. So like the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society is um, they attracted the ire of that guy in Pittsburgh. But they're a Jewish organization, but they also help non-Jewish immigrants. And they I guess they do legal work for them and they give them, you know, uh, financial support and stuff and they help them in some way. Uh, but, they, you know, it's, it's part of the American Jewish Congress. And then there's other organizations like the Republican Jewish Coalition, which are conservative and the Zionist Organization of America, which is uh, supportive of the, of the more right wing parties in Israel. But they're also um, they're also somewhat more supportive of, of, the, of the right wing in, in America, too. So, um, you know, it's just like any other organization that's out there. There's nothing, you know, magical or special about the ADL. I mean. Well, they're worth studying, they're worth learning about because they are so effective. I mean, they are well-funded, but they also punch above their weight. They're incredibly influential, just like George Soros. So George Soros revolutionized criminal justice in the United States with his selective donations of a million dollars here and a million dollars there. So maybe we should learn from how is George Soros so influential how is the ADL so influential? But, um, but also to be clear, if Greenblatt was replaced tomorrow, if the articles that the people complaining, what is it, the, the okay to be white meme thing, if, the, if that article was removed tomorrow and they said, oh yeah, that was a mistake. All, all the points, it, 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 the idea that that would change these people's perceptions or they, they, the way they would use and attack this organization is, is, is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, it would be the same attacks. Well, no, because the ADL has a list of people that they want Twitter to ban and it includes the most voice horrific names in the campaign that Elon Musk, I mean, like, for example, Keith Woods was banned for over a year. What, what, what do you mean? No, you're, you're saying they would stop attacking the ADL if they had a new CEO. Well, I don't know. I don't think it's that much about the CD, CEO. It's about the ADL's campaign for censorship. And most of the people that are leading the, this campaign are on the ADL's list. And the ADL was actually so your, your, advice the ADL to stop, your advice to the ADL is to stop. Um, uh, trying to limit the pl proliferation of violent hate groups? Is that is that what you're saying? Well, well there's two things. I mean, first, just what Leg Day was saying. That, I mean, Truman, with the creation of APEC... Okay, let's uh, tackle a cliche in the chat. Virtually all Jews support mass immigration into white countries, but an ethnostate for Israel. Where do you come up with this stuff? All right, most Jews, like most non-Jews, are not politically active. So 90% plus of Jews don't have a considered position on immigration. Now... Those Jews who want immigration restriction and want to build a wall in Israel, right? If they're citizens of the United States, they want the same thing in the U.S., right? The most Zionist American Jews tend to be the most right-wing and the most likely to vote Republican and to most favor immigration restriction in the United States. Left-wing Jews, whether they are in Israel or in the United States, favor more immigration and more multiculturalism. So by and large, Ashkenazi Jews tend towards the left, both in Israel and in the United States. But about 90, 95% of American Jews are Ashkenazi. In Israel, Ashkenazi Jews only comprise about 40% of Israeli Jews. So Sephardic Jews and Mizrahi Jews, they support building a wall, immigration restriction, right, for Israel. And when they live in the United States, they tend to favor the same policies in the United States. So right-wing Jews favor immigration restriction in America and in Israel. Left-wing Jews support higher immigration rates for both Israel and for the United States. But Jews like Episcopalians and Japanese Americans and Mexican Americans are not primarily thinking about uh, immigration politics or you know these lofty issues. They're just trying to earn a living and uh, take care of their families just like everybody else.
back in the 40s wanted a single voice to speak through the for the Jewish people it was too complicated. All the various Jewish organizations, since you have APAC created, you have the conference of the presidents of the major Jewish organizations, which APAC is a member. APAC is you know, basically part of the Federation uh, Jewish Communal Relations Systems. In most major cities, APAC uh, you resides together in the Federation buildings and even gets funded by the Federation. And it serves to deal with the community leaders, the police, the FBI, and the politicians through one voice. So the, the uh, do you mean to say ADL or, or APAC? Well, APAC is uh, the member organizations are the are the conference of. Okay, Luke Croft says in the chat, Barry Weiss is pretty much the encapsulation of your average politically engaged American Jew. She is profoundly liberal in New York, blood and soil nationalist in Tel Aviv. She's not profoundly liberal. She's liberal in some things. She's conservative in other things. I mean, do you know anything about she has been leading the fight against wokeism in, in schools, particularly private schools as well as public schools? So she set up a substack. She set up a university to fight against the liberal hegemony in uh, culture and in uh, the, the news media. So she's, she's not some raving left winger in New York and some blood and soil right winger. She is fairly centrist, both with regard to Israel and with regard to the United States. In some things, she is right of center. In other things, she's left of center. The presidents of the major right. Jewish organizations, of which APAC is like one of the 40 some members. Oh, weren't we talking about the ADL? Yeah, the ADL is one of like the 40 members of the conference of the presidents of the major Jewish organizations. Yeah, that's right. That was the organization I was I was thinking of, conference of presidents of major Jewish organizations. Yeah, yeah I, I, actually... line, uh, I forget the, the, the new guy. I mean, you have the AJC, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, but APAC is you know, basically the defense arm of the uh, conference system that represents about, you know, basically organized Jewry outside of Orthodox Jewry, that uh, Orthodox Jewry. She has the same positions, Barry Weiss has the same positions with regard to multiculturalism and immigration, basically for America as she does for Israel. You, you can't provide any evidence that uh, her positions are different. You can just spout these talking points. She does not uh, partake in the, that system largely. But well, I mean, which uh, I'm pretty sure that, that there are some, it, it doesn't, aren't, aren't a conference of presidents of American Jewish organizations, aren't some of the people uh, Orthodox within well, that? Orthodox well, like, why generally... are you talking about APAC? Because APAC also is, uh, the collection of organizations in the conference of the, the presidents of the, no, no, we're about the ADL. The ADL is a member of APAC. Uh, so when you say, oh, Barry Weiss is for a multicultural West, but not for Israel, well, if she supports the, the current Zionist state of Israel, it is incredibly multicultural. About 25% of the, the population there is not Jewish and is actively hostile to it, like far more hostile to it than American minorities are to the United States. I, I don't get it. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's it. I think I think you're screwing up the organizational chart. I think APAC is a member of the conference. Well, APAC is a member of the conference, but they're basically all united in one unit. And although they're well, all, I think I don't think they're united. Is, I mean, they're members. Two different organizations. Too much into bickering about how how, uh, how it works. I mean, it goes back to Truman who wanted. I'm gonna I'm gonna impose some moderate discussion here because I don't care about the structure of these organizations. Um, DS. Um, uh, one question I have for you is you so you say oh that. Who cares if they want to get these hateful people off? And I agree that the people behind this are, are vile, hateful people. But my concern with, with investing in this power, the reason I'm against it, strongly against it, is uh, or investing even Twitter with this power to remove so-called hateful conduct, provided that they're not advocating violence. If you're advocating violence, you should be off. But people who are bigoted, you know, the problem is on a blind drawing, we've seen with woke. And Laponia says that 25% of uh, non-Jewish population of Israel was not imported into Israel. They were there, bro. Well, thousands of non-Jews uh, moved to Israel every year, right? Uh, non-Jewish spouses, uh, all, all sorts of people who, who are not Jewish are allowed to immigrate to Israel. Hope that everything gets defined as racist. With Israel, you see people who are critical of Zionism, like myself, who are not Jew haters, get defined as, as, as the same as Keith Wood. So do you think that there is a concern about line drawing that might give you some hesitance as to whether, um, you know, it's, it's a good thing for organizations like the ADL or SPLC just to, like, provide lists of hateful people and say they should be um, removed or, or otherwise uh, have their reach limited. And then Robert should speak because Robert's wanted for a long time. Um, I, I'm a little confused by the... The ADL does not speak for the majority of Jews. First of all, the majority of Jews are not politically active. They're not you know, thinking in, in any kind of coherent manner about politics, including immigration policy or multicultural policy. So as far as active Jews, right, Jews who are active in Jewish life and, say, doing Jewish things like studying Torah, most active Jews are Orthodox and feel largely apart from the ADL's agenda. Now, if you're referring to ADL represents the perspectives of most secular Jews who are politically active, then I think you're probably correct.
the question because it began with, do you think they should have this power? Uh, what the power to they can't tell Elon Musk who to ban. And the chat says the Israelis just gunned down some Eritreans a couple of days ago. They're just allowed to do that and remain a respected member of the international community. So they just gunned down these Eritreans for no reason. These Eritreans were just sitting there studying the Bible and Israeli troops came along and gunned them down. No, the Eritreans were posing a threat to public safety. They commit a, an enormous amount of crime. All right. And when you engage in disruptions to the public safety and you defy police orders, I don't really care if the police gun you down. And that's in the United States, that's in Australia, that's in Israel, that's in Japan. If you defy police instructions and you continue posing a threat to public safety, then yeah, I'm absolutely A-OK -okay with the police gunning you down, whether it's in California, Tokyo, London. They have influence, though. Like, 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 like I would, I would be happy. Here's what I, I, I would be happy if Elon Musk, if, if, or not just Elon Musk. Maybe Elon, they have no sway with him. I would, be, I would be happy if we lived in a country where basically the standard response of every social media chair to organizations like the ADL SPLC. Uh, Israel has suffered invasion from tens of thousands of illegal immigrants from Africa, and they haven't, you know, gunned them down systematically. They haven't even expelled them. All right, so Israel has suffered. It would seem to me, just off the top of my head, proportionally just as much illegal immigration as the United States. And unlike the United States, where illegal immigrants are rarely African, overwhelmingly illegal immigrants into Israel are African, right? Very different people than Israeli Jewish citizens, not really compatible with the Jewish state of Israel, a massive disruption, dislocation to the Jewish state. I, I hope that the Jewish state summons the will to expel them, just as I hope the United States summons the will to expel its illegal immigrants. I'm for the same policy for both countries. Expel illegal immigrants, whether that's England, France, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, or Israel. It would just be to say kick rocks if they say ban this person. That would be my preference. Well, I, don't think, I, don't think it, I don't think it's your preference. But, but, wait, but, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Let's, let's, let's be specific here. But, but in, in the general, before we get specific, I want to get, I have a specific question. I'm just trying to understand. But the general thing you bring up is, um, is about, like, should, should anybody be banned, you know? And so all I would say about that is we've run this experiment called GAB. Um, okay, I would support banning anyone who docks us meaning someone who publishes home addresses, I would support banning them. Anyone who encourages acts of violence, anyone who encourages criminal behavior, I would support banning those people from the public space. And I would be A-OK -okay if uh, social media platforms chose not to amplify those who refer to different groups as essentially subhuman. So. Um, I, I, I'd be okay with if social media companies decided to ban such people. I'd also be okay if they decided not to uh, amplify their, their reach. But uh, no doxing, uh, no instigating of criminal behavior, no instigating of self-destructive behavior. So no encouraging people to drink bleach, anything like that. I would, I would be all down for, for banning such people you should go there check it out <laughs> well you know? Know, would gab even exist if social media i'm sure gab is just a disgusting cesspool i'm sure of it. but, but isn't sure. that what you that, oh, i don't that, want that I, I, I don't think you'd have gab if you had free speech on a platform i think most people would reject these ideas one of the reasons i'm, I'm having this space is because i want to encourage people on the right and the chat says so you confirm 95 percent of american jews are ashkenazi i believe that's correct and they support mass immigration in the u.s but an ethno state for israel i said no such thing i said uh 95% of uh, American Jews are not you know, politically active, right? They're, they're not political activists, and they certainly don't support an ethnostate for Israel. American Ashkenazi Jews have the same basic politics for the United States as they do for Israel. So Ashkenazi Jews tend to be on the left in the United States. They tend to be on the left in Israel. They tend to be on the left in you know, various countries. To more forcefully reject these vile people behind this hashtag. I mean, right, but right, but do you, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So, how absolutist are you against? Right? So, I don't think you should be censored if you're not advocating violence 
or engaged in like uh, defaming a person as, as is defined under the law. I think if you're simply a, a bigot, you have prejudice against whether it's homosexuals, transgender, African Americans, whites, Jews. I don't think that should be grounds for censorship. Okay. Nor, okay. Nor do so I think, nor do I think, no, let me clarify. Nor do I think Holocaust denial, for example, should be because. And, and the reason why is I'm concerned about line drawing problems. Okay. okay. So yeah, Does I, that I mean, you have to get problem. censored it, by the police first. Okay. Does that they, mean they can ban people who say that what's happening in Russia, and I deplore what Russia's doing, but it's not genocide. So then okay. they'll say, oh, some blue hair so, person will say, oh, if you say that isn't genocide, you should be banned. So I'm, I do not trust these people to line draw. Um, Mike, so, does that mean that so, people should only get banned if the police or some body has ruled that they violated that, that the, the Twitter should have no place in making this determination? And Luke Cross says, when I say that most Ashkenazi Jews are left wing, you just mean that they're not in favor of expending Lebensraum in the West Bank. No, I mean that they actively fight to sabotage the Israeli government's struggle to deport tens of thousands of illegal African migrants, that they are left-wing promoting um, you know, homosexuality, transgender, all the other things that people on the left in the United States support, they also support that in Israel. So those Jews who favor strict immigration policies for Israel also tend to favor the same for the United States. Those Jews in America who favor loose immigration policies favor the same thing in Israel. ...themselves, and they should only be banned if there's actually been legal uh, precedents to find them guilty of... It to be legal. No, I, I wouldn't say it has to be that extreme. But So, like, legally speaking, under the Brandenburg decision, if you advocate violence in an abstract way, it actually, if you say, like, the Jews will have to exterminate at some point, um, will have to annihilate them and kill them, um, that wouldn't be criminal, but I think it should be banned. Okay, uh, so here's my specific question. Let's take, uh, let's take Fuentes, and he gave a speech in July, and he said... Uh, we will make them die in a holy war, them being Jews. Okay, and it was broadcast on Rumble. Um, and this is a guy who's clearly said that, you know, he's very interested in doing pogroms, physical violence, physical attacks. Um, obliquely, he's smart enough not to just say it outright, but uh, there's a, a clip that I refer to as zero to 60. I would reference that. So let's... Yeah, if this description, Nick Fuentes, is accurate, then I would be fine with the social media platform banning him if he is instigating criminal violence take this guy and he says his life goal is to like go to war with jews he said that on twitter actually let's take him so you think uh he should be back on twitter yeah. i would have to look at the comments that you're referencing i think that we have to we have to be careful about the line between hyperbole and a literal call to violence i will say if he's actually calling for violence against jews i would i would ban him I he's not to... he's smart enough not to he's, he's smart enough to know how to over well, his militant rhetoric whether it's a black panther or whoever, I wouldn't ban them on that basis. I would ban them if they are actually... Right, every politician talks about we have to fight. So it's invocations that we have to fight, fight for our people, fight for our nation, fight for what we believe in. Right, I wouldn't ban people for saying that. In a way that a reasonable person would find to be literal, threatening to violence against a minority group or, or any group. That's my view. Well, our views on this really matter. Doesn't The real question is the lobbying pressure on Twitter to see to the demand. So say, well, as a Jew, I don't like that these people don't like me. I don't like that they're organizing against me. And Laponius notes that the Anti-Defamation League threatened to destroy Iceland's tourist industry if Ireland banned circumcision. Okay, so circumcision is a fundamental ritual in Judaism. So why would a Jewish group not object if you know, a key ritual in their religion was being banned by a secular state? So it makes sense to me that uh, the ADL or any Jewish organization would want to be hostile towards countries that wish to ban fundamental rituals in the Jewish religion. Why would they not? Why would they just be A-OK with it? And in order to defend myself, I'm going to pressure Twitter to kick these people off. I, I don't, I'm not attacking Dovid because I, I don't, I, I, would, I really don't know him that well. But I just, I do have a Dovid story because it's funny. And I don't know if he remembers this. Dovid. Dovid. What? Dovid. Dovid. Sorry, my, my fault. And you, see, you seem like a nice fellow, but uh, it's just funny because I did a debate versus this anti-Semite named Adam Green. And, uh, and do, do, Duvid came on and he just came to the and, and Duvid is a he's an Orthodox Jew himself. And it was very bizarre because he was basically defending and backing up Adam Green. But anyways, just an interesting story. Yeah. For some reason, Duvid likes these neo-Nazi type. I don't understand it, but it's very well, it's just yeah. allyship and saying that the, to me, the ADL is a bigger threat. I, mean, I would say the Hasidic community in general feel the like ADL is a bigger threat. Okay, so people who live on the margins, again, who feel a sense of commonality with other people on the margins. So I have experienced quite a deal, you know, quite a lot of my life on the margins, so I can, you know, have empathy for other people on the margins. And I think that's what's going on with, with Duvid and his empathy for, you know, other political distance. I think uh, Duvid feels like a dissident. 
and so he has above average level of empathy for other dissidents even though on the face of things they may disagree on this or that there is an um, an emotional commonality between dissidents that includes people from Duvid to Adam Green I, I think also dissidents who feel on the margins of their community and of uh, public life, that they're also the ones who believe that the United States is on, on the brink of civil war or the United States is on the brink of, of breaking up. And I don't think this reflects anything about the United States. I think this reflects what life is like on the margins, of which I have had quite a bit. I I wrote on the pornography industry for about 10 years, which very much put me on the margins of society. I've written about the alt-right on and off for years, which again puts you on the, on the, the margins of society. So I know about life on the margins. And I know when I was a kid, there were two occasions when I tried publicly lighting fires when I was about age six. And I can't fully accurately place myself back in, in my six-year-old body. But I have a sense, I remember I was a pretty miserable kid. And I just noticed in the world around me that miserable people try to create more misery, people who feel on the m- margins, right, feel a sense of empathy with other people on on the margins. I h- probably had an inclination at age six that I wanted the world outside of me to go up in flames, just like I felt like my own life was I- in flames. So I think people who feel uh, on the margins kind of not able to reconcile perhaps various parts of their own lives, they then take what's going on with them and project it out into the world around them. And so they see all sorts of impossible contradictions in the world around them because they experience all sorts of contradictions inside of them. On the other hand, people who are at ease with themselves and don't experience a lot of contradictions between you know, various parts of their lives, various parts of themselves, their relationship with friends, family, community, profession, educational institution, uh, church, synagogue, right, they are much more likely to you know, see or believe in a coherent uh, functioning United States outside of them. So I think we frequently don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. When people are unable to reconcile various parts of themselves or various parts of, of their life, when they feel on the margins, when they feel on the periphery, right, when when they can't, you know, mend these various warring segments in the, in their themselves and their own life, then they're going to be particularly attracted to believing things like the United States is going to split up. I, I have one friend who just sees doom around every corner. The, the latest doom is AI, and then other doom is prosecuting January 6 rioters, that uh, that's going to lead to a civil war. And then he had 15 other explanations for what would lead to a civil war and how the United States was you know, about to blow up. And this has been his perspective for about 10 years. And so I don't think any of this has to do with what is objectively happening in the wider world. But I, I suspect that for, for people with this kind of orientation, because I've had it, right? There was a time, 20, 2014, 2015, when I thought the United States was going to crack up, that there'd be a coup, that there'd be some sort of civil war, something like that. And this was a time when I was struggling with over $50,000 in credit card debt. My life didn't add up. My life wasn't reconciled. My life didn't work. And so I saw chaos and an impossibility to maintain the union inside of me. And then I projected it outside of me into the wider world. I think we all do that. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. A great article in the Financial Times, Donald Trump's status as an anti-hero is making him unstoppable. It talks about the appeal of the former president's mugshot, his inability to stick to the script. They are all part of the fascination. Right, he's only increased his lead in the Republican primary since that image of Donald Trump in Fulton County Jail. He's now 50 points clear of his nearest rival, Ron DeSantis, in many surveys. His mugshot has become iconic. And uh, Donald Trump looks to many Americans as a martyr. And uh, Trump is no feeble martyr. He is something altogether more based. Trump is the ultimate American anti-hero. So... Anti-hero is normally associated with fictional characters, but it's someone who plays the central role in a story despite possessing none of the virtues associated with a traditional heroic lead character. So the anti-hero tends to be a bewitching, unrepentant, 
amoral outsider who breaks old rules and creates new ones while leaving chaos in his wake. That strikes me as a very accurate description of Donald Trump. It strikes me as a pretty accurate description of many dissidents. So Donald Trump's popularity was foretold by decades of pop culture obsession with and adulation for the anti-heroes such as Tony Soprano in The Sopranos, Walter White in Breaking Bad, or Michael Corleone in The Godfather. People love anti-heroes because they are fascinated by their amoral, even immoral stance, a stance which the individual cannot really take because they'd get into trouble. So people admire anti-heroes for their transgressions, for their corruption, for their wrongdoing as a kind of aesthetic achievement. So an anti-hero is not a villain, right? He might be twisted, but he's not pure, e pure evil. So Donald Trump has all sorts of redeeming features. He has charisma, he has charm, he is relatable, he has huge stamina, and he is very, very funny. And he's unafraid to other things that others will not, right? We love anti-heroes because they say what shouldn't be said, but what we really believe, and they do what shouldn't be done, but part of us thinks it needs to be done. So Trump is willing to go off script and stick to what he thinks he should say, despite all his advisors saying, no, no, don't do that. So Donald Trump right now stands a very good chance of being reelected president of the United States. Then these um, far right counter Semites. And Can like, we, it, 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 it pays the team up it pays the team with, up. with regard to like, 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 like Corbin or something like that. It pays the team up, uh, you know, with the uh, for time and purpose in these cases. Duvid, I'm going to defend you pretty short sighted. Uh, I, I think the issue is that right now, I guess you could say that, OK, well, uh, these mainstream groups that have the power of censorship are the bigger threat because they're the ones with power. And, you know, these guys are just uh, these guys are just crazy. So uh, or, sorry, not these, guys are crazy. these guys don't have any power. So they're not really the threats to us. But I think that, like, in order for them to be able to help you, like in order for allying with them to actually gain you anything, they would actually have to have some sort of power. And uh, otherwise, allying with them wouldn't be worth your time, right? Right, I agree. And if they had any sort of power, then, uh, you know, then the argument that, well, they're powerless, so they're not a threat to us doesn't make sense. So I, I I'm, I'm think, not uh, trying to get you to bash Duvid, just to be clear. I'm not trying to do that. Can I make a quick point in defense of, of Duvid? It's, it's not really a defense. It's just, uh, okay, um, er, earlier we were, we, uh, uh, History Speaks interjected that, you know, we don't have to talk. And Duvid says... You learn way more Torah and what the rabbis actually say watching Adam Green than Luke Ford. Yeah, because what uh, less than 1% of my content is about what rabbis say. So I guess he's right. Uh, David says, Adam Green is extremely careful to correctly quote his sources and to play videos of rabbis and exact quotes. I don't know how, uh, how scrupulous uh, Adam Green is in these areas. Am I biased towards Jews? Yes, I am a convert to Orthodox Judaism. I am biased towards Jews. Does this lead me to engage in confirmation bias in favor of Jews? I'm sure it does lead me to engage in confirmation bias in, <laughs> in favor of Jews. Yes, those, those are good points. About the organizational structure of these different groups and what their relationships are. And I agree, it's, it's, not, um, it's tangential to our discussion. But I wanted to point out, that the American Jewish community really is collectively better at lobbying in defense of their interests than other groups. I mean, um, you know, these different Jewish organizations are quite well organized and quite effective. I mean, APAC is very effective at getting their way um, there. You know, and, and that's just how, how it works out is that certain groups are very effective at lobbying and, and sort of the business of government, uh, of, of influencing government. And when, you, when you're good at something and you, and you have some power, you have to use it judiciously. And I think that the ADL does not always use their power judiciously. And uh, they end up pissing people off who aren't necessarily Nazis. Um, and, and you have to be smart. When you have power and you have influence, you have to be smart about how you use it. We just do left-wing, right-wing. They're saying the ADL major Jewish organizations are left-wing Orthodox Jews and right-leaning Jews. Do they team up with the larger Jewish uh, structure or team up with the right-wing and say, well, I'm on the right-wing. I'm going to join with the anti-Semites for these right-wing purposes, not my fellow Jews who are on the left-wing that have the opposite view on things like censorship. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, Duvid, like, that's still... Okay, Duvid says in the chat, uh, Ford and I, we've never once interviewed a mainstream Jew. Well, I I've interviewed... You know, probably over 100 mainstream Jews. I did a series on American Jewish journalism where I interviewed the 60 leading American Jewish journalists. This was in 2004. I did a series on American Jewish literature where I interviewed probably over 40 uh, Jewish novelists and short story writers. Uh, also interviewed many rabbis. So I just haven't done it on video in the last few years. So I used to he used to be known as kind of the Matt Drudge of the porn industry for many years, and then I became known as the Matt Drudge of Jewish life. And I've largely 
largely disengaged from reporting on, on Jewish life uh, over the last 12 years because it is very difficult. It's very demanding. It's very painful. It's very awkward to report on your own community. So I've largely disengaged from it. Really, because like uh, Jews share collective interests and uh, right and left wing Jewish organizations have to cooperate like to defend collective interests. Like any group that faces a problem like far right anti-Semitism and being targeted with, with hate crimes. And then, you know, for that reason, the opposite approach. I mean, that's what the ADL is most hate. Like I would say, Hasidic Jews probably hate the ADL worse than uh, these counter semites. Well, I mean, at, the at the end of the day, I didn't think Hasidic Jews pay that much attention to the ADL. I, I mean, traditional Orthodox Jews just don't pay much attention to the ADL, except for instrumental reasons if they need help with something. You sometimes have to just align for common interest and common purpose, right? Like, like I think that like Orthodox Jews who think that like, uh, you know, um, who are very much appalled by gay pride parades, just uh, along with, you know, people who are very pro LGBT, whatever, just have to, you know, agree to disagree on like, on gay stuff. Do, do, I mean, it's the exact opposite. In New York, it's the main do, base, it's black crime and the ADL teams up with police organization and politicians uh, in the opposite way that uh, the Hasidic community would want tough on crime and to focus well, on the ADL, should stop. That, the, the ADL should just stop doing that because that's, you know, if, if what they're doing is is damaging, you know, their, their main purpose, which is to defend Jewish interests and, and what they're doing is, is driving a wedge between them. They support reform and catch and release. And looking at the chat uh, comment, what about white people? Are they allowed to defend their collective interests? Of course they are. And uh, I think perhaps the most important point is why do white people do such a lousy job? Why do white people find it so distasteful to engage in you know, racial spoils wars? Uh, white people don't really, they really look at people like Al Sharpton and Jonathan Greenblatt as, as heroes and don't want to emulate them. Do, yeah, do I, mean, drop it. I mean, because that, they should just drop that stuff. That do stuff. The ADL is a bigger, if you're Orthodox Jew in Brooklyn, the ADL is a bigger threat to you than any of these guys on Twitter because they're actively... I mean, that's not an unfair point. Well, I there. I mean, like, I, I agree with you. Like, Wait, uh, how is the ortho, uh, ADL a threat to you if you're a traditional Orthodox Jew in Brooklyn or in Crown Heights? Uh, I, I just don't think the Anti-Defamation League matters to traditional Jews, except in an instrumental way. If they, they occasionally need its help. I think, uh, what you're, the reason why these guys are a smaller threat is because they're the losing team. Siding with the losing team isn't going to get you any political power. So I, and they're uh, not our neighbors. Like, I, I mean, the, well, these guys, they're, and they're not our neighbors. They're not like they're in red states. You know, Keith Woods is in Ireland. If you're in Brooklyn, uh, the, the ADL's policy pushing for uh, bill reform and various. Uh, Nick Nick Fuentes is in Chicago, Chicago, buddy. Are there any Jews in Chicago? I think it's funny, but he's also in a different neighborhood and saying that. Oh, he's in a different neighborhood. So no big deal. About, no about big deal. So, like, I mean, even though Nick Fuentes has his opinions about the Jews, is it more important that he agrees about law and order and strong policing than his counter-Semitism? Yeah, you shouldn't, if you're Jew, I'm, I'm not Jewish. If you're Jewish, you shouldn't align with people who are some of the people who murdered your relatives. It's just pathetic. Like, you're not yeah. a man. You might, look, I, I, I'm saying this as a non-Jew. If I see a Jew sympathetic to Nazis or neo-Nazis, like, I don't consider that to be a man. Frankly. Like, no, if you're like, that much of a cuck. No, I mean, you're missing the main point. So if you're in Brooklyn and your main issue is black crime and you're teaming up with anti-Semites in a different part, you know, like, say, Staten Island, and you're saying, okay, those guys don't like us, but they're in a different part of town, and our main issue is black crime. They're not the ADL. Uh, like, let's, 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 let's just move on. Let's just move on. Like, just like, on to like Giuliani. Yeah. I mean, just like voting Republican uh, for Giuliani, like Stop and Frisk. Like, most Orthodox Jews yeah. like Stop and Frisk. They want Stop and Frisk re, uh, re-put in place and make pay. Okay, okay, okay wait. Let's, 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 let's just move on. Society. Why would you talk? Why would you team up with a group that clearly loses every battle. Like, even if you, even, like, even putting aside the moral uh, reasons to not ally with them, uh, you know, like, well, it's it under Giuliani. That it's, I mean, uh, up with Giuliani. Giuliani. So, so, so I also say there's a difference between somebody who may not like Jews that much and may have made an, you know, in, in his heart of hearts, he doesn't like Jews that much. Uh, maybe Giuliani doesn't, I don't I have no idea. And somebody who, like, sides with the Nazis. I mean, it's just, just no comparison. Why Why are we even talking about Giuliani? I think this is because Giuliani, this because is all side Because anti-Semites also like Giuliani, but Giuliani and the, the anti-Semites and the Jews had common interest in tough on crime policies. And in order for Giuliani to win in the election, Jews had to team up with anti-Semites in order to get a Republican in office that would institute stop and frisk. Okay. Well, I mean, just like Trump. It, it was really the creation of the alt-right and teaming up in order to get Trump in office for certain concerns. And that's what he said, like, okay, Nick Lantis, he's like, okay, we don't like him saying all these bad things. I, I think that's a really bad thing. Teaming up with him for certain the policies. Like successful pen pictures of Donald Trump, he didn't really do very much uh, once he was in office. Like, the problem is if, you, if, you're, if your, like, idea is, okay, we're going to team up with the people who have the opinion that we like and that's how we're going to choose our teammates that's not going to that's not going to win you and it's going to get you victories the way you're going to get victories is by siding with the team that has more power so i, I think this idea that oh let's side with this team that 
has some of the same ideas with us. Well, that's choosing a losing team, even if they have the same ideas as you, isn't going to get you anything at the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's more strategic to side with the winning team and then maybe get them to uh, moderate their opinions a bit and say, oh, let's place our bets on like these internet schizos who are... Right. This is good analysis. The alt-right seems to overwhelmingly have an addiction to losing. They're not interested in being effective. They are acting out of some compulsion that place them in the position of being marginalized on the periphery, you know, unhappy and unsuccessful in life, all right? They have these compulsions that have circumcised their lives, that have held back their lives, that keeps them in these endless cycles of losing. Uh, one manifestation of their endless cycle of losing is embracing, you know, extreme forms of politics that, uh, you know, regular people find extremely distasteful. But we... we have these emotional states and then we feel compelled to reinforce them. So the most intense emotional state that I have from childhood is rejection. All right. I, I grew up in foster care for some years. I, I remember moving about quite a bit as a child. So the most intense emotional experiences I had as a child were being rejected. And so my, my longtime therapist said I, I should call my autobiography, the uninvited. And so as an adult, I felt compelled to unconsciously recreate circumstances wherein I would be rejected and you know kicked kicked out uh, again and again and again and again because those were the most intense experiences that uh, I, I had as a child. And so too many people in in dissident politics, whether on the right or the left, right, there are emotional, psychological. You know, spiritual soul based reasons why they feel very much on the margins on the periphery of polite society. And so they engage in language and behavior and choices that will keep them on the margins because this is what is familiar to them. This is where they've had the, their most intense experiences of being rejected and pushed aside and kept on the margins. And so people tend to want to perpetuate you know, these intense emotional experiences of uh, childhood. So let's get. Dude here speaking with Ricardo. Yeah, dude. Um, yeah, it's funny. You weren't trying to destroy the guy, and you were you were being very polite. But I think he was just like, uh, you know, these these normie people. They... All right, this is Ricardo speaking about Matthew Gabriel, PhD student in history at London School of Economics, who hosted the Twitter Space on Ben the ADL. Where we just heard some excerpts of Duvid and Company talking with History Speaks, aka Matt. They just the reaction with like many of the things you say or many of the things that we say is just, uh, he can't take it. He, he, he is he Jewish or what is he? he's some sort of foreigner, right? But he's not Jewish. Well, I, I had mistaken. He's not Jewish. He's, he, he's not a foreigner. He's, you know, born American. Uh, I, I, I don't think it has anything to do with Matt. Couldn't take it. Like Matt handled himself, you know, perfectly respectfully and respectably in that, that discussion. So I don't agree with uh, Ricardo's analysis. Yeah, and I think he's American, but I think his father is Anglo Egyptian or... and his mother's Egyptian. His mother's he's not Egyptian. Jewish. And he, it's unclear his background, like, because because there were so many people on the panel and we didn't just get to talk, but it's possible that he himself was like a revisionist or a denier at some point. No, he was never a revisionist, never a denier. You can't be that reckless. And then he looked well, into it. And, I find uh, it interesting because the only mutuals I have that follow him are basically, you know, like the vault right types, you know, like Halsey English. And so it's like, why would this little crew like follow this guy? Because history speaks, Matt is interested in uh, some parts of right wing politics, the extreme right. And he's interested in Holocaust denial, not because he believes it's true. He's interested in it, in it as a phenomenon, as someone who believes in history. And he sees the, the flagrant, you know, flouting of all the evidence-based uh, suppositions for history. And so he takes it on as a hobby. Guy. Well, because he's been putting a big thing into debating um, revisionists and he was trying to use the minimal code for the YouTube uh, standard. But uh, so he sure, may sure. have started out as a revisionist and then he decided to get his PhD in like World War II. And then he made a big deal out of like trying to debunk deniers and right. debate them. He went this like multi-month long, like really like two year long campaign to get Mike Eno to debate him. And he finally did, but <laughs> he was like messaging Eno like daily for uh, like weekly for like years <laughs> until he finally spoke. Okay. He was, I think he was messaging Enoch uh, daily, but uh, yeah, you have to put in some effort to get guests. 
And he particularly wanted to combat Mike Enoch on the topic because Enoch is a leading voice in that area. It was probably not a debate that was easy to arrange. Spoke to him and like he's spoken to a few revisionists, um, like all type. Or Thomas seven seven seven. You familiar with it's that character? What? Who? So Thomas seven 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 is, I guess, what would be called a neo-Nazi, uh, someone who's who's friendly to a Nazi perspective on life. Old hype. Uh, Matthew Gabriel refers to him as a frenemy. So old hype. He's this interesting juxtaposition of someone who often tries to come across as just very facts-based, statistics-based, but he's clearly driven by you know, very strong emotions to you know, some really weird you know, anti-Jewish rants. But uh, he, he likes to do it in, in the guise of just, uh, just sharing facts, man. Are you familiar with Thomas 777? It sounds vaguely familiar. I mean, was he back he's in the like, mm, No, he's like, I think he sort of got as a bigger account after we were done. But like Pete Canones, are you familiar with that one? He has like a, he started out libertarian and like took the red pill and he has Thomas 777 on there to like. Okay, so the chat says, Rabbis spit, spit on Christians. That's a common observation. Yeah, about point, point zero zero one percent of rabbis spit on Christians, right? There'd be a higher percentage of, of rabbis and Christian clergy who abuse kids than, than rabbis who spit on Christians. All right, exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly rare. But yeah, you could probably find uh, three, right, uh, for, for whom that there's evidence that they, they as a regular thing, they, they try to spit on Christians, right? So 0.001% of rabbis. Like, you know, who's like a, a revisionist. Not a very, you know, it's very subtle. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I think, uh, I, mean, I think it's becoming subtle. kind of main. I mean, I, I was thinking about this other day, man. You realize, like, the things that we used to talk about on that show are like normal right wing online discourse now in a lot of ways. Well, because the, the, I mean, the Republican Party has largely fallen apart. I was telling him at the end after we talked, we we're talking about the ADL that, I mean, you, you have to be a white Christian to be a Republican. Well, well, it used to be that way, but I say that the demographic changes already occurred. That the, the traditional American Republican Party necessitated a supermajority of white Christians, and that supermajority of white Christians no longer exists, and therefore you no longer have the traditional Republican Party. So there's the attempts to like you know Luke Ford, Ben Shapiro, um, neocons, Charles Moskowitz types to redefine the Republican Party, um, but I'm not sure. That, I don't think that's going to work. And is there like a George Bush? I mean, I mean, it sounds like you Bush. Bush. You are just like kind of out of politics now. You've kind of just like given up. Like you say, like okay, we lost. Are you going to bite? I mean, you could still be like, okay, yeah. yeah I mean, kind of family. I, yeah. Like, I mean, I, I would say that like I feel Oliver like, Anthony, it's the new world. Uh, you wish it wasn't, but like all the stuff you're worried about, <laughs> it, it's over. The demographics have changed. There's never going to be a super majority of white Christians again, and uh, you know, the nation's going. The nation's not going back. See, no, I, don't, no I, I don't know, that man. Happen. I think it's so regionalized. I think it's like North and South is like rearing its head again, particularly with like COVID sparking a lot of um, being a catalyst for even more migration, you know, where, you know, uh, red people in blue states coming South and vice versa. I think we're like sorting into basically geographic battle zones again. Well, I, mean, I think it's one of those things where the, they may have their super majority, but they don't have it in large chunks of the country. I mean, it was you who got me to talk about this at length because I just kind of, you know, briefly thought about it, but until, you know, the conversation with Norvin and Rodney, uh, and then it was like a regular talking point on like half of our shows, the balkanization of America. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like, I was, uh, I, this show defense politics. Okay. So why were they doing so many shows on the balkanization of America? All right. Because of the balkanization going on inside of us, inside of me, Luke Ford, inside of Ricardo, inside of Duvid, right. The, the, Inability to reconcile contradictions going on inside of us, an inability to cohere inside of us, a feeling of being peripheral or marginalized going on inside of us, and then that will cause us to project out and see a balkanized world, you know, all around us just filled with impossible contradictions and surely the center cannot hold or everything's going to fall apart because this is what we feared was going on inside of us. And so we project it out. Asia, like yeah. the Russian uh, Ukrainian war analysis from this uh, guy from uh, Singapore. But uh, you know, I, I see plausible scenarios now that like any day 
uh, you know, especially regarding Trump and the arrest and, and uh, the election, that uh, America could split apart. You know, they could try to arrest Trump. Trump could seek refuge in a state that will refuse to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and you, know, you know, that's never going to happen. Right. I, I wouldn't put the chances of this at even 1%. Right. I mean, I don't believe there will be a United States of America in 3,000 years, but I, I believe that the chances that there won't be a United States of America because of some internal fragmentation in, in the next 40 years, I'd place those odds at uh, below 1%. You no, know, remember our. Uh, especially the Russia, we keep on doubling down in like Ukraine, Russia. There's so many paths to the disillusionment of America that could happen any day. Yeah, you like remember. We were talking uh, about it five years ago, it was just hypothetical. I, no, I completely agree. And I just remember... Um, yeah, I, I don't believe we're that much closer to the dissolution of America than we were five years ago. But that has nothing to do with America. It has everything to do with the people who are attracted to seeing that kind of reality, where I, I don't believe it's actually there. Monsieur, it was probably October of last year, he like did this whole thread about... Um, he basically... Whatever happened to Monsieur has just gone off the deep end. I noticed after the last year or so, his, his tweets are just crazy. Seems to have completely lost touch with reality. He basically for, said that the, primary, the Republican primary process would, you know, split apart the Republicans and that there would be, like, some catalyst of, like, them trying to jail Trump leading to, yeah, like a governor, like someone, yeah, some, some refuge. And then, the, you know, if you're not sovereign, if the federal government's not able to go in and get him, then what else are they not sovereign in? Like, why would you send them taxes? So... But, you know, geopolitically, the breaking apart of the United States will be... Uh, the reason you send them taxes is because your life will be a lot easier if you do so. <laughs> you are cruising for a bruising if you don't send in your taxes. That's the best reason to send in taxes. Probably bad for Americans in terms of the ability to be dominated by foreigners. Unfortunately, that's kind of already happened um, in that... It's dominated in certain ways, like military. America is the most self-sufficient of all the major powers, right? We are less reliant on foreigners and on foreign trade than any other major power, right? We are protected by these two enormous ocean moats. We have the world's most powerful military by far. We spend more on our military than all the other countries of the world put together. Terribly. I mean, like, like, I mean, still think even if the U.S. collapses, that the U.S. is still probably from the best places in the world to be because, you know, geographic isolation protection against uh, provides yeah, huge resources. Military resources and population relatives population sparsity that i would say yeah. even post collapse that the u.s is still probably from the best places in, in the world to be but you know it's kind of interesting in that i could see you know i mean i don't know where david gets this idea that uh, i changed my mind like richard spencer in favor of immigration and multiculturalism i haven't changed my mind in favor of immigration and multiculturalism i still have the same basic views. I am for immigration restriction. I am for an end to immigration, essentially, to the United States. And I believe we need to put more effort into creating a dominantly unified American culture. So my, my views are the very opposite there. You know, are they going to put the woke away and try to, like, is the regime going to kind of try to synthesize what they've done into, like, a new, a new uh, identity? You know, I think Trump in some ways is almost, like, being set up to, like, be the vehicle for the destruction of elect, like, of democracy. You know what I mean? Like, the right well, wing. Two things. The you want to. I mean, like American identity is kind of like globalism, new world order, or bust. And so you like Trump. And, and the other thing I said is that, you know, he he claimed that like the left hates America. And I said, well, no, the left just wants to redefine what it means to be American. But I think you mean like Richard Spencer's turn that the left at least has a vision for America. The 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 right, the Republicans have no vision for America. And like, so at best you have like Trump, Ben Shapiro. Well, I think the right has a vision for America, less crime, you know, lock up super predators, uh, restore more freedom of association and rights of private property, uh, create America where bakers don't have to bake, you know, gay pride cakes if they don't want to. Bro, it's just like some version of crony capitalism claimed meritocracy and constitution that's based on global dominance and we're probably not going to have global dominance so the left is the only one that has a vision for uh, no I, I think there's that we're on a trajectory to lose global dominance I, I think we're on a trajectory to have increasing global dominance in in the years ahead you know the continuance of the multicultural uh wokest experiment 
And I mean, if you well, look the at left, the, the left the, is the keeper the original of the vision on the, on the right. Front. Sure. Like, even you yourself, like I doubt, like, you know, when we were talking five years ago, your vision was like, okay, we have to reverse demographic change and end immigration. Yeah. I like what autistic merit puts here. It sounds like you're mistaking a less confrontational, more thoughtful, more highbrow, more nuanced approach and style for a fundamental change of position. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's accurate. I've taken my show in a more highbrow, less confrontational, more thoughtful, more nuanced uh, direction and uh, ha have uh, fewer blood sports and more thoughtful discussion. But I still hold with, with all the basic things that, that I held in 2018, essentially an end or severe limiting of immigration and taking steps to create a more coherent society in the United States to reverse the declines in social cohesion, social trust, to lock up super predators, uh, do away with affirmative action, and instead create a more merit-based society. And even at that point, I, I want the American government and American society to favor people making the right choices and to punish people making bad choices. So the more we give to the homeless, the more we encourage homelessness. So I would like to see less subsidizing of antisocial behavior and more subsidizing of pro-social behavior. So I think that was my basic position in 2018, and I think it remains my basic position. Okay, I want to play some Charles Murray here. This was put up on YouTube seven months ago. They haven't taken it down. Intelligence, past, president, and future Charles Murray and Helmut